Okay, welcome back to CBY Spotlight. We are joined tonight by Rabbi Dr. Ari Lam. Ari, how are you doing? I'm amazing. I'm excited to be here. Okay, thanks for coming. We're just going to first address the elephant in the room, the absence of Rabbi Schreier. Some might have noticed. Uh, he did not get kicked off, but Baruch Hashem, we're filming this the night after the birth of Rina and Rabbi Schreier's son. So, whereas he wanted to be here and he really tried to make it in the last minute, he might even still walk through the door. We're still holding out hope. But uh, it was a little bit of difficult timing. The show must go on. So we're going to try to do this without him. We're going to do as best we can. But mazel tov uh, to the Shrier. This podcast belongs to us now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're going to we'll see if it's too good. Then, uh, you know. Okay. All right. So tell us a little bit about who the lambs are um, and what brought you to B'nai Shura and to Teaneck. Sure. Uh, I'm Ari Lam. Uh, my wife is Shlomi. My kids are Perry, Sarit, Maya, Mindy, and Norman. Um, we moved to Teaneck uh, five years ago, maybe a little bit more, and we we hadn't found the shul that we loved. Um, we, you know, they all have strengths, and and it was more about us than about any particular shul. Uh, then COVID hit, and everything kind of fell apart anyway. And it was at that time that we were davening in a block minion at uh, at Miriam Morty Favors. Good uh, friends, good friends good of ours, people. amazing people. Grew up, Morty grew up in Bnei Assurance. Absolutely, so basically you're already in Bnei Assurance. Absolutely, and as you know, we kind of developed very some very close friendships during that period of COVID, which was an interesting element of that. Um, that was when you know a lot of change was going on at Bnei Assurance, and we'd already heard good things about it. The rabbinic staff, as we we heard, was already superlative, uh, but that was when a lot of change was going on. And uh, I knew of Rabbi Schreier from, from when I was in YU, and I was already an enormous fan. So my thinking was, well, if, uh, you know, if a, shul, um, you know, a shul this big to make a decision that good is very extraordinary. Wow, okay. And so we figured, uh, let's give it a shot. So I think... Uh, it's a shame he's not here. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, listen, that's uh, when the elephant's out of the room, yeah, that's what we talk about. Uh, so I think it was, uh, there was a kumzitz that Bnei Sharon hosted like the first Shabbos that we were thinking of, in, of uh, becoming members of the shul. It was a kumzitz with Simcha Liner. And we walked into the Kiddush room downstairs and it was like standing room only. It was the most labadic thing we'd been to in Teaneck. And all the rabbis spoke from Rabbi Shafransky to, to, to yourself, to Rabbi Zatz, Rabbi Shreyer, and, and it was just, just phenomenal. And it was so ruachdik. And I remember coming home that evening and saying to Shlomi, that's it, I found my shul, we found our shul. And uh, uh, I think we signed up as members like that Muncie Shabbos. Wow. So that was it. It hasn't been because it's every week since then, but it's still been uh, hopefully rewarding uh, the decision there. Oh, we've um, loved it. Okay, so maybe we can discuss a little bit. So for those who don't know you, incredibly impressed in your own right, we'll get to some of your own endeavors, but you happen to be uh, the grandson of Rabbi, the late Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. Uh, who is one of the most influential Rabbanim leaders of modern orthodoxy in America. And uh, on a personal note, my first uh, paper in NYU for my first year English writing class was on modern orthodoxy, relied heavily upon Torah Umada by Rabbi Lam. Uh, I take a lot, I think like many Rabbanim from Drashot Lidorot from Rabbi Lam. So uh, certainly a, a great influence for me. Uh, can you talk a little bit what it was like being his grandson? I don't know if he had a special relationship. Was he learning with you? Did he have time to take you to ball games or whatnot? Like, what do you remember? Sure. Um, so I, I, I'll actually start with the high school piece. I was a bum in high school, but I was a serious bum. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was the kind of bum who would cut class essentially every single week, but I would cut class to go to the teacher's lounge to spend time with Rabbi Schiller debating things. Um, he would give me books to read, and so you know, I kind of used my time on anything but school. But I, I tried to use it wisely. Um, I started learning together with my grandfather in high school, which was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. That continued in much more serious than when we got to college. But I will say that um, growing up, I had no concept, and I'd venture to say that that most of my cousins, until we got a little bit older, had no concept that he was anybody. Um, of particular importance because he was Zaida. That's what he was, um, and it was it was it was you know you could kind of you could you were aware that people had a certain measure of respect for him and and treated him uh, with a with a degree of kavod that bespoke his accomplishments. But you know you kind of chalk that up to him being a rabbi, and you know you knew other rabbis in your life who also people treated with with respect. Um, so I think one of his great strengths was in never making any of us feel 
that he was, you know, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. And in that respect, uh, I think one of his, his truly wonderful accomplishments was in ensuring that his service of the Jewish people and his, his public service towards Kal Yisrael uh, was a case of zenena, of a zenena for the community and for his family. Like we never felt that we were, um, we never felt that we had to loan out his time. We always felt, um, and I certainly always felt, uh, embraced by him and seen by him fully with no compromises. Um, so growing up with, I, I didn't grow up with Rabbi Lamb. I grew up with Zaida, and that was that. Wow. Did you, as you developed and, you know, I guess it became more clear to you that you were going to head into, not a classical pulpit rabbi track, <laughs> but certainly something in the clay kodesh, uh, did, did you turn to him as a mentor for advice? Did you steal yeah. any of his dressers? Did you like handwrite anything for here and take it? Because you did serve as the rabbinic scholar in uh, the Jewish, Center, the Jewish yeah. Center. Okay. I did. Uh, one of my clearest, most terrifying memories from the Jewish Center was the first time that Rabbi Levine let me speak publicly in the Jewish Center. Uh, rabbi Levine, who was the senior rabbi when I was the, when I was the at that time, the rabbinic intern, um, really understood the, the, the seriousness and the, the kind of sacred reputation of the Jewish Center pulpit. So he wouldn't let just anybody speak. And I think once he had, had taken my measure and had assessed that I had kind of met some, at least like minimal standard for being able to speak publicly, like he could let me out of the closet or something like that. So uh, he said that I could speak in the Hashkama minion. And that was the minion uh, that my grandfather sometimes davened at. Not, not always, um, but that Shabbos he decided he was going to go to the Ashkama minion and hear me speak. And uh, so I prepared my drasha. And at the time, you know, I was, I was young and foolish enough to assume that I had, like, crushed it. So we're walking, I remember we're walking um, from their apartment on 88th and Central Park West. And uh, as we're walking, my grandfather says, so what are you going to speak about? So I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to speak about. And I told him my drasha, and I was just waiting, you know, for the attaboy that I assumed was sure to follow. I'll never forget, uh, we had just turned off of 87th Street onto Columbus, and I finished the drasha, and my grandfather, who at the time was, was, was uh, you know, becoming physically infirm, he wasn't walking very quickly, so we had time, um, and he, he had a walker, and he stopped, and he looked at me, and he said, that was terrible. Oh, wow. And I was like, well, we have a block and a half. Yeah. So I started to panic, but to his credit, he was never he was never a critic for the sake of criticism. He was always a, a builder. I mean, institutionally, intellectually, philosophically, and also emotionally. So his, his immediate next sentence was, okay, what's your main idea? I gave him my main idea. He said, okay, that's not bad. We can work with that. And he said, well, why don't we structure it this way and put this here and put that there. And then here are two or three turns of phrase, I mean, which were so magnificent, I could barely pass off two out of three of them as my own. But he said, here are two turns of phrase, and you had a nice turn of phrase here. If you remember this, put that here, put this there. By the time you, by the time you get to show, you should be able to figure it out. I don't think I davened a single word of yeah, yeah. I was so panicky. And I also have no memory of having given that gesture, but I do remember that after I gave it, after I gave it, um, I sat down next to my grandfather and he grabbed my hand and he gave me a squeeze and I could tell he was very proud of me. So that was a very special moment. Okay, so moving on to your uh, own very uh, successful career. For those who don't know, even though you're diving in our mitt, very impressive resume. Smicha from Reitz. I'm not going to get everything here. You got a PhD from yeah. Princeton, written for the, the Wall Street Journal, for Newsweek and others. You were the special advisor to Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, president of YU. And I'm sure I miss a few. Now... I, I, you have a, a couple things on your plate. You're the CEO of, the, of B'nai Zion, yeah. you're the host of the Good Faith Effort podcast, and the co-founder of Soul Shop Studio. So I don't know if we can get into everything, but if you care to give like an overview of what these uh, projects are, if you want to pick one, or you can give all of them, um, and just uh, give a set. I don't know if there's like an underlying theme between them, or sure. this is just different things that you're involved in. I'm just very passionate about Jewish ideas. I think Jewish ideas can change not just our community. I think Jewish ideas can and must change the world. The world is waiting for ideas. So every, every single thing that I do in all of those endeavors is all about bringing great Jewish ideas out to as wide an audience as possible and translating our ideas for a broad audience. Um, 
what we do at Menes Lion and what we do at Soul Shop is we're all about media and entertainment that strengthens the Jewish people and supports the state of Israel. Um, and one of the projects I'm most proud of, so uh, just for a little bit of backup, um, at Soul Shop, we're like a full stack studio. So we're a full, media studio. full media studio. Uh, we work with some of the best talent, top talent in the industry, and it's been an incredible ride. And um, one of the projects I'm most proud of, um, we dropped about two months ago. It was with an influencer named Montana Tucker. Montana Tucker um, is a uh, TikTok and Instagram influencer. She's a couple million followers. And uh, when we got connected with her, uh, she's we Jewish. Learned, well, so her name is Montana Tucker. She's an actress, model, dancer, something like that. Blonde hair, blue eyes, and a bajillion years, you would never think she was Jewish. But turns out, when we got connected to her, we found that she is not only Jewish, but her grandparents are Auschwitz survivors, wow. and her great grandparents were actually killed in Auschwitz, and other family members were exterminated in the in the Belzitz death camp, and. She had never explored this, this uh, element of her personal story. And the original idea that had been brought to us was, um, let's shoot like a half hour, hour long documentary, you know, about the Holocaust and whatever it is. And eventually we'll like clockwork orange a bunch of Yeshiva Day School students into having to watch it for, you know, Olam Voed while they're just, you know, begging to check their phones. Um, and we said we, we felt like we could do it in a way that actually speaks to the younger generation because our whole thing is about reaching the youngest generation possible. Um, so what we did is we said, you know what, let's go, uh, let's take Montana back to, uh, to Europe to explore her family's story, their synagogue, their town, Auschwitz, Belzitz, and so forth. And let's shoot the whole thing in vertical so it's meant to be viewed on your phone. We're gonna shoot it episodically, so we're gonna be 10 episodes. Each one is like one to three minutes long. And we'll release, uh, and we'll release uh, one episode at a time and really penetrate, and we'll release it on Montana's channels and really penetrate culture that way. Um, the, the, I believe it was the night or two before we dropped the series, uh, Montana told my, my uh, kind of co-partner in this, uh, Dan, she said, just so you know, like, you know, we, oh, we had said to Montana, this thing is going to get like a million views on day one. She's like, listen, I just want to set expectations here. It takes time for content to get a lot of views. It'll probably take a couple of days or weeks to get to that many views. If we get there, just want to temper expectations. And we said, no, 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 no. This is going to crush. We dropped the first episode within five hours. It hit a million views. Wow. Um, Within six hours, we had gotten calls from Good Morning America, from the Today Show, from PBS, CBS, uh, all wanting to do a story on it. And we kind of brought them to Montana and said, um, you know, which one do you want to do? We picked Good Morning America. They covered it, did a whole story on it. It was great. That was not the win for us. The win for us was um, the win for us was when People Magazine called and did a story on it. When E News called and did a story on it. When Variety just wrote it up. Like these are. This is your goal. You're trying to get out. So these are publications, like in the heart of culture, like the heart of pop culture. They have never written about heavy content like this. I've never written about the Holocaust. But Holocaust education was the last time they talked about those things. Maybe never. And so for us, this was like the real victory. The real victory. And eventually, you know, six million people saw this series by the time the the episodes ended. Now, I mean, it must be millions and millions more who've seen it. So our whole thing is we, typically when we try to fight anti-Semitism as a community, it's like in the most nebuch possible way. We're either yelling at people or writing open letters or threatening people or we're producing the most boring nebbish possible content or we're trying to enlist you know, B-list celebrities from 20 years ago to say something. Uh, and for us, it was about actually penetrating culture at the root and really reaching those younger audiences. Wow. And we were able to do it, thank God. Unbelievable. And again, I know we're, we could talk for hours about all of this. Let, let me shift for a second to the Good Faith Effort podcast. So for those who are, obviously everybody watching this that are big podcasters and listeners, um, a little bit about that, or maybe even if you want to make a suggestion of one or two, if our audience, uh, sure. what the idea there, if they want to test it out to try to get into it. Sure. Uh, the idea behind the podcast is, as I said, I'm a big believer that Jewish ideas will change, can and will change the world. Uh, and so my, I always tell people it's a grasshopper podcast. I'm thinking about the Pasuk and Shlachlacha where it talks about when the spies come back from Israel and they say, 
Vanahika Chagavim Veinenu Vachina Yinu Beinenu. It's a great trash by Rabbi, if I can exactly, say that. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So it says, we, we felt like grasshoppers in the eyes of the inhabitants of, of, the, land of, of the land of Canaan, and so, uh, and so we were in their eyes. And if we look at ourselves as grasshoppers, everyone will perceive us as grasshoppers. But if we realize that we are stewards of a 3,000-year-old tradition that undergirds all the greatest accomplishments in the history of Western civilization that serves as the foundation for the entire American experiment, then we will be able to be the agents of change that this country and this civilization needs. So my whole thing is every single week I take a theme or idea uh, from the Torah, usually from that week's Parsha, and I discuss it with a major figure in their own field. Um, and I sort of put the ideas of Tanakh and Jewish history and Jewish thought uh, in conversation with someone who's an expert in their own field. So sometimes it'll be a journalist, it'll be like David Brooks from the New York Times, or it'll be a major sports writer, it'll be an Oscar-winning producer, a Grammy-winning artist, um, or it'll be a historian, or it'll just be someone that, that is less well-known but that I'm just enthralled by. Or an NBA athlete, come on, yeah, I can yeah, give you yeah. some credit, Ennis Cantor. Yeah, Ennis Can- okay, on we the had podcast. Ennis Cantor on the podcast, we had to bring him to Israel, that guy's amazing. Wow. Shouts to Ennis. Um, and uh, if I could recommend two episodes for people to get into it, um, two that kind of span the spectrum, I was really fortunate enough to have, to have someone I deeply admire uh, by the name of Robert Alter. He's the greatest living translator of the Bible. Um, he's an absolute artist. He's a literature professor. He's, you know, mega, mega bestseller. And, uh, and he's just an unbelievably sensitive reader of text. And he's a penetrating reader of Tanakh. And he had just published his magisterial translation of the Bible into English, which was making waves. And I kind of did whatever I could. I, you know, I, I, I begged, stealed, and borrowed to get him on the podcast. He agreed to come on, and it was just a dream come true. And the other episode would be, uh, uh, there's a book that was just published this past year. as a number one New York Times bestseller called Blood in the Garden. And it was, about, it was about the 90s Knicks. Um, my favorite basketball team of all time, bar none. Um, and Chris Herring, who's the author, is a wonderful, wonderful guy. I had realized from following him on Twitter that he's a person of deep faith. I mean, he's a, he's a Christian. He's a, you know a member of his church. He talks about how his his most prized possession in the world is a, is a, the Bible that I believe his mother left to him or that his father left to him. And I had not seen and I had seen you know hours and hours and hours of people interviewing him, and no one had explored his faith. And it was clear if you read the book, it was clearly a huge part of how he told the story. Um, one of the sources that he relied upon most for understanding the 90s Knicks was Pastor John Love, who was the, pe- who was the team pastor, who was the guy who kind of said, listen, you all think you know Anthony Mason, you think he's a psychopath. And he is a psychopath, but he's also a very serious person of faith. Um, also, anyone following the Knicks has to have faith if you're going to you know, stick to it at this long. The, it's, right, exactly. It's like the Alpha Pichy yes. it's experience. It's a shame. So I had him on the podcast, and he was just fantastic. And that was really... I can was also second all, that. Yeah, it was okay, episode, unbelievable right? stuff. Um, okay, too much to get into. We're going to shift gears. Um, oh, actually, before we even move on to the more rapid fire, you're also a pretty sought-after scholar in residence. So I know you've told me some of your stories. You had some Pesach programs, some Shabbos. Is there any one that stands out other than an average Shabbos in nature, which is always memorable? But any one, I don't mean to put you on the spot. That's a good question. Is there anyone in particular that follow up on a out? personal? How does one get invited to a pace out program, <laughs> fully paid gig? You know, who do I call? Let me know. Well, I'll tell you. I, I have just incredible hakara satov to to Rabbi Shai Shechter, who was the person who recommended me for the first time on one of these uh, on one of these things. And I call Shai Shechter. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. You know, I've been, Satov, I've yeah. been uh, very I've been very close with the Lasco family ever since, and they're just phenomenal, really incredible, incredible people. So. I owe a lot of a karsatov to Shai Schechter. Like a most interesting scholar residence story. Um, the first person who ever gave me a shot, I think it was either the first scholar residence gig I ever did or one of the first, was Rabbi Jay Kelman of Torah in Motion. I'm also forever grateful to him for giving me a shot. He brought me in to be uh, as one of three speakers. And I, I think I served on a panel on that Shabbos. I was all of like, at the time, I was all of like 24 or 25. And he put me on a panel with two really heavy hitters, one of whom was, the, the, one of whom I'm forgetting, but the other of whom was Moshe Kapel, mm-hmm. Professor Moshe Kapel from Israel, who's, who's already at the time was like a superstar, and I think was, was perplexed what I was doing there. And I, per, frankly, did not belong there. But the fact that he had confidence, uh, probably misplaced, but confidence nevertheless, that I could, that I could uh, maybe hold my own on a stage like that, 
was just so unbelievably affirming. And uh, it's people like that who trust in you even when you don't trust in yourselves and maybe are a little bit crazy to trust in you because you don't necessarily deserve it yet. Those are the people who, uh, who are really special and you always have to be Makoto to Beautiful. I think all of us probably see what he saw in you, but uh, that's a great <laughs> perspective that you have. All right, so just to wrap it up, we try to have some uh, rapid fire questions here. Um, you can uh, answer as briefly or not as you like, <laughs> as honestly or otherwise as you like. So here we go. Let's see. Are you a morning or night person? Oh, night person. Okay. Yeah, All right. I'm, I'm like taking calls at three in the morning. Oh, I'm gosh. Guy. Okay. <laughs> not the I used to be and I recently shifted to morning. Okay. If you could choose a different field to be in other than, I guess, the ones you are in, uh. Uh, money not a factor. Is there anything that uh, comes to mind? Oh, man. I always thought I was going to be a rock star when I was younger. Mm. Like, I, I yeah, always, I do. I'm a guitar, I'm a guitarist um, and an like, aspiring drummer. Um, I, we're all drummers, I guess, right? Like, yeah, just, just being just aware different. of the dish, yeah. Exactly. Like, they always say about, I was a wrestler in high school. They always say about wrestlers. You never stop being a wrestler. You just go up in weight class. So, <laughs> you never, you never stop. You, everyone's a drummer. Just there's some are better than others. I hear, I hear. Um, I always thought I'd be a rock star. I always wanted to be Bruce Springsteen because I love Bruce. I've listened to every single album. He's unbelievable. And I always thought he was like the Batman of rock stars in that, like, he wasn't particularly talented at anything. He was just a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a great, doesn't have a great voice. Not a superhero. Not a great guitar player. I always thought I could be Bruce, you know, but uh, alas. It didn't happen. All right. I was really hoping you were going to say Rabbi Ebene Shur and make this a little interesting, but uh, okay. Where Ebene Shur is not here anyways. Okay. If you could have, uh, this is always a tough one, if you could have dinner with anyone alive today. Yeah. I feel like the, I feel like the, like the right answer that you're supposed to give, like the meaningful minute answer you're supposed to give is like my mom. And that is true, <laughs> by the way, but I feel like in the spirit of trying to be interesting. The honest answer. answer. <laughs> right, right. No, the honest answer is my, is my parents, oh, okay. but they made Aliyah, yeah, I, I would love to have dinner with them on a more regular basis. So that is the true answer. But in, in honoring the spirit of the question, which is, I guess, trying to get, get an interesting name, um, Tyler Cowen, he's my favorite, Don't uh, my know favorite who he podcast is. host. He's an economist at George Mason University. And, just, and, and he has a column for Bloomberg that I read religiously. He is the most well-read person on planet Earth. Um, that is saying a lot. And he has a podcast that I am obsessed with called Conversations with Tyler. Um, he has always been very kind to me. I've, I, and, and he's even, all much like Rabbi Kelman and other people in my life, has kind of, uh, he's solicited my help uh, at certain points in preparing for certain episodes in a way that I kind of felt like you could easily do this yourself. Um, but, uh, but Tyler Cowan would probably be the answer. Okay. Yeah. That's the first name we've got when we've asked this question. First time we've got that name, we're asking this question. Okay, this is a bit of a weird one. If you could, if you had to pick a consistent meal, it could either be breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and a certain food for that that you had to eat for the rest of your life for that meal. Oh boy! Can you think of something? Uh, in the immortal words of Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation, I will have all the eggs you have, please. And I'm worried what you heard is I'll have a lot of eggs. What I said was I'll have all the <laughs> eggs that you have. But, uh, eggs. I'm a big eggs guy. Okay, for breakfast. <laughs> Got it. All right. Not the, not the worst food. Yeah, yeah. Um, not meaning it's healthy. Oh, yeah. um, all right. What is the most interesting place you've been to? Uh, Sri Lanka. That was the best place. Okay. I have a good friend from when I was, uh, when I was like an intern on Capitol Hill in DC back when I thought I was going to go into politics or journalism or something like Just that. Just dropping that right now? Uh, okay. That was, that was many moons ago. Um, and my best friend at the time was a young guy by the name of Prashant Devisser who ended up founding an organization that does conflict resolution based in Sri Lanka. And he invited me to be a part of this like global summit that they had. It was super fascinating, but I got to go to Sri Lanka. Wow. And it was, uh, it was a trip, man. <laughs> okay. This podcast is just making me feel terrible about my life. This is great. Um, what is the most interesting thing you have in your house? Or other property you might own? I don't know. That's a great question. Most interesting thing that I have in my house. Got you. Fine. <laughs> um, the most interesting thing I have in my house is a collection of Hespadim for Abraham Lincoln by... Uh, every single contemporary, by every single Jew who was masked with Abraham Lincoln at the time that he died. Um, all of those has paid them from across the country. Like in their own shuls, their own synagogues? Yeah, their own synagogues, shuls, or their kind of local political establishments. They were all collected into a single volume and published. And it is absolutely fascinating. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, is that for sale? Is that on Amazon? Or? Uh, I got it from my father, who is a collector, uh, who is an American historian and a military historian. He's a collector of uh, lots of memorabilia. He has a lot. He has a lot of great stuff that I aspire to one day have in uh -huh. my house. But uh. wow, okay, that's a pretty that's a pretty cool answer. Yeah. All right, and uh, finally, well, you alluded to some of this before, but any 
hobby or lifestyle <laughs> change that you adapted since COVID? One of them was coming to Vinay Shirin. Mean, yeah, like, that, that was the that was the best one by far. I mean, nothing, anything pales in comparison to that. I'm a big Peloton guy. I'm a big okay. Peloton guy. Okay, you and many others. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. So Morty Faber was uh, was Megayer me to Peloton, and it's been a, a trip ever since. Okay, you're intense about it? Or <laughs> God, like, I God. think if you're a Peloton person, you have to be intense. Yeah, I'm like a fanatic. I'm like a nut job. <laughs> All right, I got a treadmill. I'm not quite at a Peloton level, but uh, right. anyway. Okay, we usually do uh, CBY trivia at the end. I was thinking to do a little bit different, a little bit out of the box here. So we're recording this the day after the birth of uh, baby boy Schreier. Who's a bris beito bismana should be this upcoming Tuesday. I'll be skiing, so I'll miss it. But mir Hashem. So I'm going to say, if you can correctly guess the name, I mean, you could go with Shabbos, whatever you want. We will give you a, a year free of membership dues. I, I'll speak to Robbie. We'll take care okay, of it. Okay. Okay. We get it's a baby boy. It's a baby boy. Okay. I mean, I I have no idea if it's being named after someone. So it's you have like one in a million, but. So I feel like. I feel like the thing nowadays is to have like, I mean, this is what we did, but like one normal sauce name and then one like out of the box name in case right. they make Aliyah or something <laughs> like that. Um, all right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, um, let's see. Oh, well, actually, I'm gonna revise that. Rabbi Schreier is a gush guy, yeah? He is a gush guy. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go Yitzchak Aaron. Yitzchak Aaron. So Rav Aaron lived in Sweden. Yeah, I'm gonna Yitzchak. throw there. Yitzchak, just like uh, maybe there's a family name. That's okay, a, just throw that's that like out guessing there. A, that's yeah, like guessing okay. S on prices, right? Okay, okay, but, okay. Uh, and then Aaron for the for the good Got factor. it. Well, if it's Yitzchak Aaron, <laughs> I could actually guarantee you nothing. But I'll speak to the board. We'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> Rabbi Dr. Arlen, thank you so much for coming. This I is love great. It. <laughs> we miss Rabbi Schreier, but it was fun doing it anyways. Amazing. Okay.